Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. Do you ever have a thought or a plan that you just want to run with? Do you ever think, hey, I know this is the right idea or this is the right thing to do, so I'm just going to go do it? Or do you bring everything before the Lord? Because that's what we need to do. We need to bring everything before God all the time. Why? Because God's got a better plan. Amen. His plan is unique in some regards for each of us, but for all of us, it points back to what? Spreading the gospel as a messenger of Christ. Why? It is God's will we act as messengers for him in this world by following him. Amen. That's his will, that we should glorify God, we should follow God, and we see clearly that we should evangelize, we should win souls to Christ, all by the working of the Holy Spirit. We sow the seed, we we kind of plant that seed, and then God does the rest. Amen. To follow God means to change from our natural or worldly state, right? To follow God means to change. Following God is not natural to us that are born as sinners. We must be born again, amen? And even then, we're still tempted in the flesh. So we must not be natural or worldly. We must be separate. We must be set apart. To walk with God means to walk away from the past self, the sinful life, amen? Yet we're not alone. When we walk with God, we're co-laborers with Christ. We are working with him and by his side 100% of the time. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Amen. We are God's building. We're his husbandry. Amen. In terms of unique callings, uh, inside the larger calling, we can look at what the gifts that God gives us to help use us to accomplish his will here. Amen. Uh, there's uniqueness in spreading the gospel with our God-given gifts. Uh, uh, my former pastor at Glory Bound Baptist Church, Mike wrote, Michael wrote, uh, had the gift of confrontational soul winning. And we were at a uh, uh, parade several years ago in Clover, South Carolina. And uh, man, he was talking to a young man and just really had never met that young man and handed him a track and asked him uh, if he knew the Lord as his savior. And they got into a conversation and kind of spanned out, I'd say almost 20 or 30 minutes. And he won that young man to the Lord. Amen. And I just marveled at that gift, that unique gift of confrontational soul winning. Amen. I can hand out a track here or there, uh, but I, I, I'm not that confrontational of a person. And I saw that and said, wow, that's really admirable. I'm really impressed by that. And that uh, Mike would then come over and say, wow, you're really good with the computer or the radio as I would record a message for him or for one of the preachers in our church. And so God, maybe he gave me that gift of uh, preaching and teaching online and through the radio and gave Mike the gift of uh, uh, confrontational soul winning and, and uh, things of that nature. And then our, our worship uh, leader, John, he's uh, sung on the radio uh, before, uh, uh, Jonathan Cruz, a, also a, a preacher boy. I uh, gave him, uh, we believe uh, the Lord gave him the gift of music and he's uh, worship music. He stirs hearts through music. He's just incredibly gifted with music. He can sing, he can hold a key, he can hold a note, he can play a key and a note and a chord and everything else. And he's also a great teacher. So brother John has that gift. Uh, and then I started looking around beyond my immediate circle. And I thought of uh, Peter Ruckman who, who uh, would draw illustrations with chalk while preaching. He had the gift of art and relevant preaching to that art. And I was kidding around my congregation. I'd never seen a preacher preach a message with his back to the congregation most of the time. That was very effective. I, I, I believe Peter Ruckman won many souls to the Lord. Amen. I think of the street pre preacher, the ability to call people to God despite public harassment uh, as another one with a unique gift. 
I think of Brother Rocky at Crossroads Rescue Mission out there in uh, Shelby, North Carolina, using his life experience to help others get saved and get clean. Amen. Uh, we've had family go through Crossroads Rescue Mission. I've been had the privilege to preach there a uh, number of times, and it is unbelievable to see those men, the transformation that God does in their life that's unexplainable any other way. And uh, look, I'd put their success rate up against any program in the country, and it who gets the glory? God gets all the glory there. Uh, Brother Rocky, he had gone through addiction and he, he had done a time in prison and he was an unlikely person for God to use, but God has used him mightily in that ministry. And again, that's a unique gift that, that uh, Brother Rocky is using to win souls to Christ. And of course, we all could have lifestyle evangelism. We could all uh, live a life that is honoring to Christ, that points people to Christ, to be unusually charitable, unusually nice, unusually living in victory and, and, and joyful, unusually uh, hopeful for the future, unusually peaceful in times of sorrow. And you go on and on and people say, what is it with this person? They are not like anybody else. And then they say, oh, they're a Christian. Oh, they believe the Bible is God's written word, and it's infallible and true in every regard. Oh, wow. Oh, look how God has blessed them. It's all a testimony to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're talking here about the Lord's will, and I ran you through some ideas about how we need to give it all to God first. And I gave you some ideas of maybe some unique gifts that, that God has given people. And I'm sure you can think of maybe some that God has given you that he's revealed through uh, your time in the ministry or your time praying to him, or maybe it's some that you're still thinking about. Amen. And uh, God gives everyone different gifts. And I, I think a, another message would be on spiritual gifts. But the idea here is that God gives us all a unique abilities to do the same thing, which is spread the gospel, win souls to Christ. Amen. Uh, when we live for God's plan, what happens? Our lives are full, rich, and purposeful. When we live for ourselves, how do our lives turn out? Shallow, poor, and lost. You know, this is something I can relate to dearly. As I have spent the last 10 years or so involved in the ministry, uh, I've spent more time than that, but I would say 10 years really kind of head first, all in the ministry, uh, more and more progressing as the day draws near. Uh, but, you know, uh, living for the Lord, it's a full life. It's a rich life. It's a purposeful full life. It's not perfect. It's not easy. There are trials or temptations. Uh, there's all kinds of things, as, as Paul uh, aptly writes about over and over again in the New Testament. But there's just a fullness and a richness to it. Uh, and the way I would describe it is I'm 40 years young, amen, and almost 41 here. And, and uh, when I live for God and I serve God, I have that youthful joy, that youthful, like a child, just, uh, you know, innocence, you know, and just love. And I don't know how to describe it, but God just restored my heart, amen, and blessed me in such a um, wonderful way. And these, uh, you look around and, and if I had encountered someone from school, maybe middle school or high school, they'd fall over to see what God has blessed me with, a great church, great family, on and on and on. It's no way I should be in jail. I should be dead. I should be doing something bad. And God is blessed and blessed and blessed. And one reason I think the Lord has blessed me so much is because he knows he'll get all the glory because people know I'm not, uh, I was never an A student. I was never top of my class. I was never well behaved growing up. So God gets all the glory. He made such a change in me. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. And then when we live for ourselves, how do our lives turn out? You know, I spent a season there, uh, especially in my 20s, living for myself. And man, I would chase every little thing I could that was worldly. And I, I wanted to be a big, big shot business person. And I wanted to do this and that. And it was so shallow. I was so poor. Even when I had money, I was poor. And I was just lost, amen. I was so lost. I, I was looking at the world like they were going to bring me fulfillment, like they were going to bring me joy, like, like something in the world, like it was going to care for me. Like only God can care for me. Woo, I can preach on that for a minute. But the point is, I know, I can testify, I tell you with all truth, that when we live for God's plan and we live for God, we have rich, full, and purposeful lives. And we live for ourselves. Our lives are shallow, shallow like a puddle. There's no meaning to them. There's no depth to them. There's no greatness to them. And our lives are poor. We're spiritually poor. We're broken. And we don't even know it. And our lives are lost. Think about it. Peg your life to how the world wants you to live and how the world would accept you and how all the worldly things that you could get. Peg your life to that and you're completely lost from what God wants you to do. 
as the Bible says, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. And they are completely diametrically opposed, complete opposites, amen. And there's one chapter in the Bible I want to touch on for a little bit here that perfectly illustrates what God would have us to do and why. That's Philippians 1. And so I've got a few verses here I want to share, but I'll, let's start with Philippians 1, uh, verses 3 through 6. So this is Paul uh, just thanking God for the, the, the church of Philippi. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, uh, always in every prayer of mine, and for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who is he that had begun a work in them? That's God. And he'll continue it till when? Till Jesus comes for us. Amen. Here Paul is thanking God in prayer for his friends because Paul knows what is to come. I thank my God for everyone listening today. I thank my God for my church family because I know what God is going to continue to do with all of us. This is what I want to talk about today. Let the Lord's will be done. Amen. Firstly, let the Lord's will be done with our love abounding in knowledge and judgment. Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. What does abound mean? Exist in large numbers or amounts. Your love, how you act in caring for others, becomes more and more godly. That's what Paul is saying here. Knowledge, how do we grow in our understanding of God? As we grow in our understanding of the Bible. Why is this important? The Bible is God's instructions for our lives. And, and I mean, think about, uh, as uh, my old preacher used to say, basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E, amen. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's for our character. It's, it shows God's character. It's instructions for our lives by what he has done throughout history, by what he has included in his word, as in what's important to God. You know, look at themes in the Bible. Look at rep- repetition. Look at how, um, you know, if there's a covenant made in this one place and later on someone else makes a covenant in the same place, look at that place, what that means. You know, look at the the numbers in the Bible. Don't even get me started on the numbers, the number seven and uh, for completion and, and the number three for resurrection and on and on. There's great uh, info that you can glean from what God puts in there, what's important to him, and by lessons we can learn and promises we can hold dear. That's what we're, we are to do as Christians, and that's what I try to do. When I get down and out and frustrated, which happens quite often, as everybody does in this life, we get down and out. Amen. Uh, saw a brother in Christ out on, on the street today and, you know, the look in his eyes was just like stress. And I see another one. Look at his eyes. Stress. Lord knows we've been stressing out. What do we do? We turn to God's promises. We bank on God's promises. What does love have to do with it? Love, okay, love is the vehicle for making what God wants done in this world happen. Amen. So we are to abound in knowledge and judgment. Our love is to abound. Love is that vehicle for making it happen. God loved us, and the result is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, right? So God loved us. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross, a brutal, awful, horrible death for us on the cross. Amen. That's God's great love for us. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, buried three days, resurrected, walked the earth 40 days and four nights, seen by over 500, sent it up to the heaven and to the right hand of the Father. Amen. That's God's great love for us, all according to the scriptures, all part of prophecy. We love God. He helps us love each other. So that's, again, a tip for a good marriage, a good relationship, good church, everything. Love God with all your heart. Serve him. Follow his commands all of a sudden things start to fall into place. Amen. Uh, Anytime anyone ever asks why uh, our marriage uh, has gone so well these years uh, to my wife, Sue, I always tell people we both love God and we serve God first and then everything else falls into place and we love others. Uh, So God loved us uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, And as the scripture says that while we were yet sinners, amen, God loved us. We love God. He helps us love each other. And then we love others. So we love God. God loves us. Great fruitful cycle. We love others. And that's how God's will can be done on uh, here on earth. You see how love is this pattern. Uh, without love, nothing can be done. And you can uh, read in 1 Corinthians 13 about this idea. Uh, so love, abounding in love is so important. Judgment. How do we grow in godly judgment? Understanding God's ways. The Bible. That's how we grow in godly judgment. Why is this important? 
we then become right. Yeah, I said it. You can be right. You ever know anybody that loves to be right? Uh, our teenager, Kobe, he loves to be right about everything. I said he should go to law school or something. He loves to be right all the time. Well, you know what makes you right? It's being righteous. You know who's righteous? Jesus. You know how we understand Jesus? His word, God's word. Amen. There's all kinds of commands of Jesus in the Bible. Yeah, people ask, what would Jesus do? Well, you could go in the Bible and look at what Jesus did do and what Jesus commanded us to do. Amen. We must understand Jesus. Amen. That's how we become right. That's how we understand truth. This creates a moral firmness. You look around today, there's universalism, there's relativism, my truth isn't your truth, and on and on and on. And that's the devil's way of skirting morality and truth and all the things that we know are right and wrong. And I talk to my wife about this all the time. There was a day and age before we lived, probably, when there really was a moral standard, when things like stealing was absolutely wrong, when things like adultery was absolutely wrong, when things like... Um, Fornication was absolutely wrong. When things like divorce is absolutely wrong. When things like um, uh, 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 homosexuality was absolutely wrong. On and on and on. And now I just named everything that Hollywood loves to put in a movie, that uh, the popular musicians love to put into songs, and that the devil loves to shove in everyone's face and say, this is right. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. That's scripture right there, folks. It's happening and yet, when we get into God's word, we can rightfully judge. We can study the real thing to spot that counterfeit. Uh, many preachers, I think, have used this uh, example. When you go to school to study counterfeits for the FBI or CIA, Secret Service, whoever handles that, uh, they spend a lot of time, I think a year or two, focused only on the originals before looking at counterfeits. And the logic there is if you can understand the originals so, so well, intimately well, then you'll immediately be able to spout, uh, spot a counterfeit. And these are people that are doing this for a living at the highest level. And uh, when we study the Bible and we get into God's word and we know it very, very well, it's so easy for us to spot a counterfeit. Now the devil is subtle. The Bible says the de devil's very subtle. And so, yes, of course, we can get tripped and duped. And, you know, there are times that I'll be researching things for a message and I'll have to really look and say, is this doctrine correct? And does this line up? And what does the commentator say about this? And on and on. But generally speaking, as we study God's word and understand God's word, then we have that righteous judgment. That's how we can be abounding in knowledge and judgment. And then we can truly rightly divide. And what does love have to do with it? When we act in love, we can be judgmental in what we know uh, is right to execute righteousness that's in the best interest of those that heed the call. And think about if I had a friend from work that was cheating on his wife, I could do three things. I could tell him that it's a sin, that he must repent before God and sin no more. I could tell him it's okay to keep doing it. So I could tell him this is wrong. You need to fix it. Go to God and ask for forgiveness and stop. I could tell him it's okay. Keep doing it and leave it alone. And I could do nothing. Well, my friend might want me to do nothing or tell him it's okay. But if I love him, which one would I do? I would tell him the first one. I tell him that it's a sin, that he must repent before God and sin no more. You see, that's righteous judgment, not what someone wants to hear, not by being a worldly friend, but being a godly friend. And that's just one example, but that's how we abound. That's how we grow. That's how we exist in large numbers or amounts, as the definition of abound says, in judgment is by the working of the Holy Spirit within us, helping us to understand and discern what God's word says, what thus saith the word of God, so that we can rightfully judge. Amen. Secondly, so first is abounding in love and uh, or abound, uh, love abounding in knowledge and judgment. Secondly, living for Christ and dying in gain, but not vain. Philippians 1, 20 through 21, a very familiar verse. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Oh, such a famous verse. One that I, I actually kind of wrestled with for a while uh, as a babe in Christ uh, for a season there. I, I thought, well, how, how could it be gain to die? And now I, I truly get it. I'm going to share it here. But Paul is showing himself as an example that he hopes and expects to live boldly for Christ as to magnify who Christ is in his life. And then we'll get to his death in a minute. But in his life to magnify Christ, what does it mean to magnify well, 
What do you do when you magnify something? You enlarge it. I, I know I gave this example in church and all the young people looked at me cross-eyed, but hey, you know, there's that thing called a magnifying glass, or there used to be. I guess people probably use their smartphones or something else now, but you got the magnifying glass and you put that over something, say a newspaper, and what happens? One thing under that magnifying glass gets bigger and all the things around that magnifying glass, what happens to them? They get smaller because that one thing is magnified. What we need to do is we need to make Christ bigger in our lives and walk in a way that shows him more clearly to others. We need to magnify Christ. We don't need to look too deep into this. This is very simple, very straightforward, cut and dry uh, scripture, which I love. I appreciate that. Paul's saying, look, in verse 20 of Philippians chapter 1, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. So he does nothing wrong, okay? I don't want to be ashamed. I won't do anything wrong. I don't, bring, I don't want to bring shame to Christ. I want to live for God. But that with all boldness, so boldness, all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. We're talking about life here. How do we make Christ bigger? In your daily priorities, what you do and when you do them. You know, do you get up and do you start your day with a prayer, maybe a little bit of Bible study, maybe journaling, maybe singing a, a song of praise, uh, you know, going for a walk with the Lord, whatever it is. Do you start your day in that way or do you work in your day? Do you have your priorities? You know, it's one thing to say you put God first. It's another thing to actually put God first. You know, if you wrote a journal out of your whole day, where would that time with God be? Would it be on the journal at all? And would it be first? And would it be significant? not just in your daily priorities, but in your goals and aspirations, what you aim to do and how you are to do them. You know, we should make Christ bigger there. Our goals should be Christ-centered. Are your goals centered on glorifying Christ, on bringing glory to Christ? Don't think that that's not important. You know, it, it really is. Where do great plans start? They start with goals and dreams and aspirations. Amen. You're not just uh, walking around and one day say, okay, I'm going to go do this. And you, you walk out and do it. Most people, they, they dream of it. They plan for it. They, 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 they get everything together. Their goals and aspirations are aligned to it. And yet most people, if you look at their goals and aspirations in this world, gosh, even Christians today, it's how do I get a second house or how do I pay off my car? Uh, how do I get my kid to college or how do I get this promotion or how do I, 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 it means it needs to be a lot less I and a lot more God, a lot more Jesus. Amen. Come on now. And thirdly, make Christ bigger in your heart. Put more focus on him, make him everything, make him everything to you because then everything else becomes less important. And I think if you do that thirdly, I mentioned it thirdly, but if you do that first, if you put more focus on him, the other two will fall into line. You'll make Christ bigger. You'll magnify Christ in your daily priorities, in your goals and aspirations, just by nature of getting him to live in your heart. You know, the uh, Bible word for this is preeminence, reigning supreme in your heart. Amen. Is that what you're doing today? He has to be first. He will not settle for second, third, fifth, 10th, 15th. And people are putting God last in their lives, putting Jesus last in their lives. And they're saying, I can't, I don't feel close to God. I don't see why God's not blessing. I don't see what blessing. Hey, Give God your heart and then see what happens. Amen. Make Christ clearer by understanding what you believe very clearly. Become a student of Christ. You know, the gospel says that. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It mentions that Paul says what, you know, he's mentioning the gospel, what I preached unto you, uh, lest you believed in vain, as if you didn't understand it. We must understand what we believe. If people ask you to give an answer, you are to give an account for what you believe and why. And, you know, honestly, a lot of Christians, I don't think they could even explain why they're a Christian or how they've been saved. And, and according to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, I believe it is, that's a problem. We must be able to explain our salvation. We must be able to give an answer. So how do you do that? Because that could be intimidating. Well, the best way to do it is become a student of the Bible. Become a student of Christ. Become a student of his word, his commands. Live them, and then you'll be able to make it clearer. Telling others what you know and what you're learning about. Involve people around you. You can make Christ clearer in, in your life and to others by giving them information that you're learning and, and talking about, uh, you know, spending time with the Lord and talking to people about how that's affecting you, what you're learning in your Bible study, questions you may have. Let them see the importance of Christ in your life. 
you know, that's worship and, and that's, that's glorifying to God. When people say, wow, that person puts Jesus first, th- that's inspiring to others. Amen. Look, people pay attention to what others do. I mean, consciously, and I believe subconsciously. So by you living for Christ, you are making Christ clearer in your life for others. Finally, debunking false doctrine, staying true to true doctrine, fighting the good fight and walking the good walk, taking action there. You know, I, I think that kind of speaks for itself. So let's wrap up this idea about dying for gain in Christ. We realize there's a relationship between how we live here and what we get there. Uh, if we are to gain our proper reward here, we must live for Christ here with all our hearts. If we being saved die and aren't living for Christ, we are still going to heaven, but not the way God intended us to. To live here for Christ is to die in gain. Our reward is heaven with Jesus, rule and reign with him, a glorified body, crowns of life and rejoicing and righteousness and glory for all those that love the Lord. You see, it's all connected. We live for Christ here, as Paul was saying he was going to do as best he could and the best we see he did. Uh, the most influential Christian uh, you know, that, that that I could see in the Bible, amen. And I say Christian because Christ obviously is uh, preeminent, amen, and God in the flesh. But those living for him, Christ, uh, our, our Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, is up at the top there. Uh, he's living for Christ, and then he has this reward, heaven with Jesus, rule and reign with him, glorified body, these crowns of life, etc. And so that's what we get when we, we gain when we live for Christ here. What does it mean to love the Lord? 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So keep God's commandments, learn them, know them, live them and keep them. You got to learn them, understand them, know them, be able to repeat them, live them out actually in action. Don't just intellectually know them, but live them, make them part of your action all the time, how God wants you to live and keep them. And if we die living a life full of selfishness and worldly living in, in opposition to this, we have forfeited much of a reward. And if we're saved, we're still go to heaven. We believe in uh, eternal security here. Amen. You're still go to heaven, but you will you, you lose your reward, the great reward that you would have had, and you'll be ashamed. And Paul mentioned he doesn't want to be ashamed. Amen. You know, imagine seeing Jesus and you've just lived for yourself the whole time. And what what are those things? You can't bring them to heaven and now they're all gone. And now you're saying, man, I wish I would have done more and it's too late. But if we live for him, we have a great reward waiting for us. The Bible says that Jesus comes. He's coming uh, to, to take his church and he's bringing his reward. So we should live for him here. We should live faithfully by magnifying him and living a life that would lead to gain when we die, being a true believer and obedient to God's calling on our life. And all that boils down to living and working to draw souls to Christ. We need to, you know, it's crazy times out here. There's lockdowns and, and for COVID and political instability and all poverty and the devil's distracting everywhere, setting traps, snares, you know, it's all kinds of stuff going on. We must live for the Lord. Amen. We must live fully and wholeheartedly for God. Amen. We cannot take our foot off of the gas now. We need to press that pedal and move forward. We can't be divided. We can't be talking about other Christians all the time or giving a bad witness in our own behavior. We can't be disobedient or we can't become discouraged and depressed at a point that we can't do anything for him. We must stay committed to Christ, study his words and his commands, put him first, far above any worldly wishes and desires, pray without ceasing, Judge ourselves lest we be judged. Understand the time we are living in. And it's the end times, last days. Constantly reflect on God's great love for us and what he gave for us to be saved. Understand God's great promises to us as believers. That's what we need to do. We need to stop thinking that this stuff and, and, and kind of taking it in one ear out the other and putting it into practice. We have to realize to win a battle it takes a plan. And we must rejoice, as Paul has here in uh, Philippians 1, that we are called to such an endeavor, that we have such a great reward waiting for us. And we must serve him until he comes again. I, I know I finish almost every message like that. Serve God, live for God, give it all to God, come to the Lord if you don't know him. But it's true. This is what we are to do. And, and this is what God has called us to do. And this is the Lord's will. And I want you to say, tomorrow. I want you to say today, tomorrow, the next day, Lord's will be done. Wake up and say, Lord's will be done. Go to bed and say, Lord's will be done. And just stay on the firing line for God and he'll take care of the rest. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for visiting the cafe today. Our goal is to inspire you with the truth and depth of God's Word in a straightforward manner. Do you know Jesus? You can today. Visit kjvcafe.com to learn more about God's great plan of salvation for all of mankind. Until next time, remember, as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 puts it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness.